Thanks, folks. You know, uh, I've just been looking at the folks who are, who are here, and, you know, there's old friends from uh, the last 20 years with the GIJM. It's great to, all, to see you all here and the new folks as well. Um, what we're going to do today is uh, it has to be a rapid overview of the story-based inquiry uh, of the uh, story-based inquiry uh, method. If you, if you want other materials to back it up, please go to www.storybasedinquiry.com and there's a page of manuals and you can download uh, you know, the work I'll be talking about today. There's a new teaching package that we just brought out with UNESCO last week, in fact. It's in English. The manual is there in a number of languages. I saw somebody here from uh, Azerbaijan. We have, a, we have a version in Azerbaijani and uh, 13 other languages. So without further ado, I'm going to, I'm going to share uh, a, a slideshow with you. And uh, we will... Uh, you know, we will not rely only on this, but I would like you to, you know, be aware that you're going to have a PDF of this when this is, uh, when this session is over. So the basic idea behind story-based inquiry is that the job is not gathering information. The job is putting together a story and also keeping the assets that you create while you're doing a story. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but you know, in my generation, when we were starting, you know, we would do stories and then move on. And you know, we would leave behind boxes of material and then go on to the next thing. And we'd have to plunge back into it if we ever went back to the same subject. It's so much more efficient now that we have computers to do this work for us you know, to keep the material and spin something resembling a career path out of it. Now, the first step down this is making a hypothesis. I'll talk to you about all these things in some detail. The second step is putting together a timeline of events. The third is putting together a source map of the people who are involved in the events or the people who have information that can cast light on the events and, uh, also who can serve as uh, characters in the story. Now, both the timeline and the source map can be used as a narrative structure. I'm gonna to talk to you about that later. I wanna be clear from the start that uh, we'll talk something about writing, but you know, about 80% of the writing job is having a structure for the story trying to put together a story out of the kinds of quantities of material that we generate is a good synonym for breaking your head from the inside out, okay? The master file is what enables you to structure the story before you write. It also constitutes a database that you will be able to go back to over the years. I think the greatest example of, uh, of a journalist making a personal database is probably the late Andrew Jennings. He's the guy who brought down FIFA. And uh, Andrew had a database going back 30 years on organized sport, which for him was a species of organized crime. One of the reasons that FIFA came down is that Andrew made a lot of that database available to the American FBI. So you know, you never know where you're going to have impact or who's looking at you. And it's always good to have the control of your material from the start to the end. Okay. Now, this, this guy is Edwy Plinell. He founded Mediapar, which many of you may know about. In the 1980s, he was, you know, the leader of the investigative movement in France. And uh, someone who, in fact, later became a source and a competitor to me. And... Uh, he said something that really impressed me at the time, which is if you want to find something, you should be looking for it. Now, that's a very interesting idea because it's not the same as saying, well, I'm going into a subject and I'm going to gather everything I can find on subject and be the world's ultimate expert on the subject. That's a really good way to drown. Okay. Plenell introduced this notion, this very simple notion that, you know, 
you have to be sensitive to what you're looking for. You have to look at what sticks around that central idea. It makes the whole process a lot more efficient. And if we look at the meaning of hypothesis, we have this definition from the Oxford English Dictionary, which, which I love because it's exactly what I thought a hypothesis was before I found the definition. And what it is, is what you think might be true. It's a proposed explanation, not a final explanation that you have to prove at any cost. You make it on the basis of the evidence that you have in hand, limited evidence, and then you investigate further. So what that means is that instead of gathering material and looking for its meaning, you already have a meaning that you're seeking to verify. If it turns out to be true, well, that's wonderful. But if it's not true, your chances of finding the truth go up immensely because you, know, you, have, you will have been working on something specific and figuring out whether or not it does explain the facts at your disposal and the facts that emerge. Okay, another way of thinking of a hypothesis is, is uh, what the French call a hat, a chapeau, or the Americans call the nut graph. It's the statement that sums up your story, that, that says what the story is about and where we're going with it. And you know the verified hypothesis fills that function. Okay, now here's how you make it. You ask a question and then you answer it. Now, this is rather different from what most of us do naturally, which is ask questions. You know, and for those of you who are teaching, you know, what students will generally give you when you ask them what they want to work on is a question. They'll say, you know, did the French government reduce uh, hospital capacity before the COVID crisis hit. Instead of asking the question, you answer it. And then you ask yourself, how am I going to verify this answer? It's, you know, it's not going to be easy for people who haven't done this before to get in the habit of doing it. But the thing you have to keep in mind is that the hypothesis is not a question. It's the answer to a question. And then we see if the answer is true or not. Now, before we get into seeing if our hypothesis actually makes sense, we want to know if it's plausible, if there's any reason to think that this might be true. And you know, while we're doing that, we have to ask ourselves, what, what shows us whether the hypothesis is possibly wrong and what could be an alternative? All of this, all of this part of the job should be done, I think, before you go full blast into an investigation. Because if you know, you're working on something that isn't really plausible, where you don't see the path to verification, where you look at the landscape and nothing stands up and says, look at me then your job is gonna be extremely difficult. And if you haven't considered alternative explanations, you run the risk of confirmation bias. You'll go ahead and cherry pick the evidence that shows you know, you're, you're brilliant and a genius and you, know, you see everything from the first day and everything you see is what you want to see. Or you, you know, there are other forms of bias as well which we're not going to get into now. But you want to play with this idea and think to yourself, where can this go? What might be another explanation? OK. There's one other procedure that I think we should be doing before we get further into an investigation. And uh, I owe this to Deb Nelson at the University of Maryland, who was someone who influenced me very greatly. And Deb, you know, won Pulitzers as a reporter. She also won them as an editor. And when people came into her shop with ideas and said, well, this is what I want to do, she would show them this chart. And she'd say, well, is the story 
important or is it of lower importance? Is it difficult or easy? Now, difficulty to me, you know, means how hard is it going to be to get the stuff? Sometimes that's very difficult indeed. If it's of high importance and easy, then, you know, the only question you have to ask yourself is, can I get this done before somebody else wakes up and smells the coffee? If it's of high importance and difficult, if you're looking at a path that's going to take a couple of years, it may still be worth it. If it's difficult and of low importance, let somebody else ruin their career. And if it's of low importance and easy, well, maybe you can have some fun with it, which is, which is always a nice thing to have. You know, investigation is a muscle and even the easy stuff can develop the muscles. But I would urge you, especially those who are teaching this stuff, that you know, when people bring you ideas, you plot this out with them. You know, if it's a student project and, and they, they have a limited amount of time to do it, you know, low importance and easy may be a lot better than high importance and difficult. And if it's of high importance and easy, put five of them together on the same project so that they can get it done before their professional competitors wake up. Okay. Now, when you're making your own hypothesis, you also want to know what other people who will be involved in the story have already said about it. You know, the victims have a hypothesis. They may have filed a court action or they may have made statements to reporters that says what they think happened. That's a hypothesis. The initiators, people who are responsible for the problem we're investigating, will always, if anybody has noticed something going on, have made a statement. You know, one of my great friends was uh, the late Anne-Marie Castoray, who uh, did the contaminated blood scandal in France. You know, she brought down a government and uh, delivered a very healthy shock to the national health system, which was selling blood products contaminated with AIDS, they knew they were doing it. They knew how many people they were going to kill. And they went ahead anyway, because they needed the money. Not a very good reason to kill people. So Anne Marie's investigation started when, you know, someone told her that something had happened to Francis hemophiliacs. She went to the head of the National Center for Blood Transfusion and said, did this happen? And he said yes, and gave her a statement that was in three parts. She verified every three parts of that statement and found out that they were all false. So obviously that official hypothesis didn't make any sense. What did make sense? Her hypothesis was that they made a bad mistake and they couldn't admit it. It turned out that it wasn't a mistake and they knew what they were doing, but that initial hypothesis was enough to get her down the path to where she could get the crucial evidence. Okay, adversaries, your adversaries or someone else's, the adversaries of the initi initiators will also have their notion of what's going on. Authorities will have them as well. So, you know, you can collect these and look at them and think, which of these sticks to the evidence? And if it doesn't, then uh, you know you have room to move. If it does, then you know you, you may not have a story to do. Okay. Now, there's one other thing I'd like you to think about. Okay, and I thought about it because I worked for 20 years in a business school. They're the people who paid for my research. Thank you very much, NCAD. It wasn't your core mission, but you gave me the money. Okay, and uh, we're going to be investing a lot of time in these stories. Time is the major investment we make, and time is the only investment that you never get back directly. You can always get money back. You can always get other resources back, but you'll never get your time back. So we need to ask, what's the return on investment that we want from this project? Now, we're short on time today. So 
I'm not going to go into this in detail, but I want to make you very aware of one thing. When investigative journalists think of the return on investment, the first thing they think about is what social good am I going to do? What social value will I create? That's absolutely central, and it's pretty much the justification for the whole enterprise, okay? Because, you know, we're, we're saying things that get people angry and that can hurt people's reputations or maybe land them in jail. And if there's no public interest involved, if there's no social benefit, then we're nothing but thugs. But there's other kinds of return on investment. You know, I usually ask this to my students because I want to see if they're capable of thinking about it. And most of them aren't. They don't think about whether they can add to their skill base if doing the investigation is going to require them to grow. They don't think about uh, the sources they will gather along the way and who they want to see among those sources. You know, who are the people that they would like to talk to and explore. They don't think about creating a database that will serve for future projects and so on down the line. You know, so I think this is an important question to ask. And if I don't know what the return on investment for a project is, what impact I hope to have beyond making people aware of the subject, which by the way is one reason that I'm also an advocate of collaborating with uh, NGOs, which was the standard operating procedure of the anti-apartheid press in South Africa and is an example that should be better studied thanks to Anton Harbor in Johannesburg for studying it, okay? But until you have a notion of what ROI you want, until you know what your working hypothesis is, until you know where the path starts, in other words, what are the open sources you can access? And until you know who the story matters to, in other words, who are the stakeholders who are involved, you don't get involved, okay? You let somebody else do this, or you come back to it when you can answer those questions. Um, I will note that uh, Robbie Robinson, of the spotlight team at the Boston Globe, you know, focuses very much on the initial path. You know, he tells his people that if they don't have uh, two or three good ideas for where the initial information is coming from, the story is on hold. They're not going to do it. Okay. We'll see the stakeholders coming back in just a moment. You know, as we get into the, uh, as we get into the idea of the uh, source map. Okay, for now, I'm going to pause on that. Does anybody have any questions about what I just told you? Don't hesitate to put your mics on, okay? No, thank you, uh, Mark, uh, Dr. Hunter. Questions or comments for uh, Mark up to this point? Uh, covered a lot of important material kind of the found foundation, but any, any questions folks would like to ask? Yes. Khadija Bufos has her hand up. Yes, Khadija, please. I would like to know, um, what if we have um, many hypotheses? Should we start by the most relevant one or should we just check every single hypothesis and see um, whether if it's the, if, whether if there is a possibility to see if it's wrong or right or what? I would like to know in this case, what should we do exactly? And thank you. You know, this is, a, this is a personal decision and it has something to do with your ambitions. But, you know, personally, I would pick the one that seems the simplest to do, okay? Because this is, this is always hard work. And if you're, if you're going down a path, for example, that requires you to get insider testimony and no one has made an insider leak to you, for example, okay? Or you're going down a path where, you know, there are, no open sources, or nobody has studied this like a scholar, you know, that turns into a very hard piece of work from the start. 
I would, I would say always pick the one that looks simpler to do. I'll give you an example of this, a recent example. In 2018, I did a project with, well, that was funded by Greenpeace, okay? They didn't work on the project. They gave me a grant to put together a team of people to look at how the, U, the uh, European Union subsidizes agriculture to see if they were subsidizing heavy polluters. Now, we, we had a working group on, on uh, agricultural data at the uh, Mechelen gathering every year in Belgium, the data harvest. And, you know, one year at that meeting, I said, well, the European Union has two official hypotheses about agricultural subsidies. They're supposed to help rural development and they're supposed to, to uh, preserve the environment. So I said, well, I have a team that's working on the rural development. And I thought it was a great idea because I live in a rural area and we get a lot of European subsidies and I could see that the place was going down, down, down. So I thought the official hypothesis is wrong. And I thought, well, the way we'll check this is we'll take the 100 biggest recipients of the subsidies and see if they're hiring or firing people. It turned out to be a headbreaker because a lot of them didn't file company reports because we had to check all the company reports by hand. There was a guy at that meeting named Stefan Verminer who was working at Corrective at the time. And what, uh, what Stefan did was take two European Union databases. One of them was for uh, polluters and the other one was for uh, agricultural subsidy recipients. He crossed the lists and he came up with a fantastic list of people who were getting big subsidies and dumping like 20,000 tons of ammonia into the environment a year. This was a slam dunk and it became the prototype for our investigation. So, you know, on the basis of, of my own experience and my own preferences, I would say, pick the hypothesis that looks the most doable, put the others aside for a moment. And then you can always go back to them when you become more expert in the subject. Has that answered your question, Khadija? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. M my pleasure. Is it possible to come with more than two hypotheses, says Maureen uh, Kawarama? Well, yes, it is. But I never allow my students to do that. I say, you give me one hypothesis. Okay. And you know, you, you can have more than one hypothesis in the brainstorming phase, but at the point where you're going to put the vehicle in motion, you have to be focused on one thing or else you don't have a, have a hypothesis. You don't have a priority. You know, you're looking at a million things and you're going to get distracted. You have to be focused on something. Now, in the course of working on that something, sometimes a story comes up. Sometimes you see something that you couldn't see before because you were not on the path. But, you know, that's a good reason to switch tracks and start investigating, you know, the, the hypothesis, the subject, the story that makes more sense and where you see that it's calling to you to get involved, you know, not to let it go off to the side, you know, but, Otherwise, pick one and start with that. And if you hit an obstacle that you can't get past, you go back and do something else. Okay, it's a long, it's a long game, folks. We're in this for a long game. You get better over the years and you get better over the months. But, you know, you pick one thing to start with. I hope that answered your question, Maureen. And, and there, have, have we... Well, I, was just, I didn't mean to interrupt, Mark. Just there's... There's a couple uh, above the one by Ismail when there's no other choice, can we rely only on open sources? Kimo Chan had one about um, giving an example of a popular source. So there's just there's five questions that, that were a little bit above as well as okay. below. Okay, regarding the, the open sources, okay, I personally think that open sources are where you start. You know, even if somebody comes in and gives you an insider story, you're gonna have to get documents to verify that story. But the other thing is that, you know, if you talk to people in intelligence agencies, you know, what they will tell you is 90% of what we do is open sources. And the way it works is that, you know, you get those open sources, you see what they have to tell you, 
Okay, and then from that, you can deduce what is not open. And when you approach someone and say, this is what I know, this is in the public domain, this is what it seems to tell me, is that true? Am I, am I completely on the wrong track now? Of course, people can always lie to you, but most people don't like to lie. You know, I mean, I'll give you an example of this, okay? Uh, in, in a book I worked on that took me four years, there was an important subplot that involved uh, the Louvre Museum basically extorting a picture out of an American museum. And, uh, you know, I asked the Louvre, well, why don't we talk about this? They said, no. I asked the American Museum, they said, oh no, that's the past. So I went over all the news clips about uh, this conflict and found a clue. The clue was that uh, the conflict had affected their exhibitions. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I wrote to them, I said, uh, you're a public institution in the US, you get federal money. You are therefore subject to the Freedom of Information Act. And I would like you to be kind enough to send all of your annual reports for the last <coughs> 10 years, which they did. And the annual reports showed that uh, the uh, exchanges between that museum and other museums worldwide fell to zero. So they couldn't put on big exhibits. So I then went to the former head of the Museums of France and I said, I know exactly what you did you shut down their exchanges. What I don't know is how you did it. And because people talk mainly from pride or pain, and he was very proud of it, he said, I picked up my phone and I called the heads of every museum I knew in the world, which is about all the museums in the world. And I said, if you ever exchange anything with those people, you can forget about working with us. And that's how he did it. So you get the 90%, you figure out what the remaining 10% is, or you make it easy for your source to tell you what that 10% is, and then you get it. So that's why important open sources matter in my view. Uh, what was the other question that someone had, Jeff? Yeah, so there was one from Kimo uh, Chan saying, I'd like the presenter to give an example of a popular story someone worked on and the information they got that got them cleared if he can give a similar one for the opposite, it would be perfect. Wait a minute, the information that got him cleared, what does that mean? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not completely sure. Chemo, might you be able to elaborate? Chemo said that um, uh, he, he's in a kind of noisy area. So Chemo, if you can elaborate a little bit on that question, uh, Dr. answer that. Yeah, um, but, but, but this is a popular story that was or was not published. I'm guessing that it was published given that the information got got the person uh, cleared, uh, but 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 maybe ah, you mean it got somebody off the hook? I think it so. saved somebody instead of destroying somebody. Yes, yes, I believe that's what that's what Kimo was asking. I don't want to speak for boy. Him. Those are some of the best days in your life. Okay. Oh, before before three information before a story is cleared by some oh, information by, by some editor. editor. Oh, I I see what he's saying. Okay, okay, you're speaking about anonymous sources, or you're speaking about any kind of sources that prove the main point. <laughs> yeah, you need multiple sources. There's absolutely no question about that, unless the whole story is about pointing to one document and the response to that document. But. Uh, you know, this will come up again in timelines, okay, which we're going to get into right now. So per perhaps we should put this aside for the moment and continue, uh, continue with the process. Okay, that, that's fine. Um, just so you know, to, to, to button for later, there's, there's a question about um, Deepak is asking about victims and stories of corruption and tax evasion who's the victim, if it's kind of big, you know, kind of big business. Um, and then uh, Gia is asking, how long does it take to develop an investigation flow? And then if someone feels wrong, but they made a mistake, um, should the journalist stop the investigation? So maybe, maybe especially the one about the time frame, Mark, you can work into as you're- as Well, you're I've done investigations that took two days and investigations that took five years. 
<laughs> okay, it depends on the story, how complex the story is and how important it is. You know, but I urge people to, you know, I urge everyone here, don't just think about the big investigations, okay? Think about your skill set and your muscles, okay? And that means if you're writing a news story and you can put one investigative sentence in it, one thing you found that nobody else found, do that. If there's a story that you can do in a, in a day or so, you know, that involves a very swift investigation, do that. You know, not everything has to bring down a government. It's, you know, that's a very difficult way to, to uh, proceed. Okay. Back into our thing. Now, this is, this is where we get into uh, a timeline, which, you know, to me is, is the Royal Road. Okay, as Freud said, the dreams of the royal road to the subconscious. Okay, this is a quote from uh, The Adventures of Sir Sherlock Holmes. The ideal reasoner could deduce an entire chain of events from a single fact. The events that preceded that fact and the results that followed from it. That's an astonishingly effective principle. When it comes down to your investigation okay you always start with something you noticed okay someone is evading taxes okay well how did they get the idea how what scheme did they come up with to evade taxes that had to proceed the day that they evaded the taxes they couldn't just improvise it they had to figure something out and then there would be consequences further down the road maybe they had to hide the tax evasion Maybe somebody started investigating it, them for it, somebody in power. Maybe uh, they went on to do other tax evasions. And in the meanwhile, somebody else is paying taxes because the government would otherwise come to a halt. So if we look at a full timeline, it always includes the causes that led to the problem or event we're discussing in the hypothesis, the effects that followed from that event, and hopefully the solutions. You know, I'm a big believer that we have to propose solutions. And the primary reason for that is that my career began in the 1970s after Watergate, when we were very, very good at denouncing everything that was wrong with the world. And we thought that's where our responsibility stopped. And the consequence of that was that we very swiftly became hated, you know, because we were just going wham, wham, wham and saying we're the only good people in the world and all of you are involved in some kind of corrupt monstrosity. A very poor strategy. If you come forward and say, well, mistakes were made, but here's how we can fix them, your chances of being appreciated and followed go up immensely. And by the way, I will note that before a truncated notion of objectivity became the standard in our business, investigative journalists did that all the time. Okay, Albert Londres expose of the prison colonies of France, Aubagne. Okay, the last chapter of it sets out four reforms. All of those reforms were carried through eventually. There is, there is no logical reason that having shown how something happened, what happened, what were the effects, we can't move on to do the solutions. And I suggest that you incorporate that into any timeline that you make as you move forward into a story, okay? Now, you can set out a paper trail as a timeline as well. Somebody gets an idea, they write it down. Then they spread the idea to someone else. And then maybe the idea is carried through and somebody evaluates it. This is a very simplified version of the principle. But if you come up with any piece of paper in the course of your investigation, if it's an important piece of paper, you can ask who conceived it, who was informed of it, and what was the response to it. And that in itself can be extremely important. You know, were they warned? Did they do anything about it? 
did they try and fix the problem? Okay. Now, the third tool we're going to talk about here is a source map. And that very simply is a visual representation of everyone and every place that's involved in the story. You can map this out before you start. And if you don't, you're making a mistake. Of course, the map is going to become more detailed as you get into a story and see who the stakeholders are, who the victims are, who the authorities are, who's driving it, who's profiting from it, who's getting hurt, okay? These things will emerge in much more detail as you proceed, but you have to start somewhere or you're not going to know what you're looking for. So let me show you a visualization of a map. This one is about, this one is from a story uh, that my uh, partner Luke Sengers did about uh, pipes that leak toxic chemicals into drinking water. Very terrifying story. And, you know, they brainstormed the story before they went down the path. If you look in the lower left corner, you see chemical scientists. The story started with an academic study by some chemical scientists who documented the migration of toxic chemicals from plastic water pipes into drinking water, okay? Just next to them are consumers. They're the people using the pipes. Then there's the government, which authorizes the use of the pipes. And then there's the plumbers. They're the people who put the pipes into houses and, and uh, workplaces. And by the way, they were a crucial source because one of the questions they had to answer, one of the hypotheses they had to verify more exactly was that in fact, these pipes were already in wide use. If they weren't in wide use, there's no story. So the first call they made was to the National Plumbers Union in the Netherlands. And they said, are your people installing these pipes? The guy on the other end of the line said, well, actually 30% of all the installations are plastic pipes. Bingo, we have a green light. Okay, chemical companies, people providing the chemicals to the pipe manufacturers who are at the center, and the pipe manufacturers are at the center because without them, there's no story. If no one is making these pipes, then they can't be installed in the first place. Finally, biologists who can verify the health effects and watchdog groups who are keeping an eye on the environment. These are the initial actors in the story. And you know, I think of, I think of a map like this as a village. I grew up in a village. I live in a village now. I've lived in cities too. But what I've noticed is that in any story, there's a village. And in that village, everyone knows everyone else or has heard of everyone else. And you look at a map like this and you think, who's going to open the door to me? Where am I going to get in first? It's not going to be the pipe manufacturers. They have reasons not to tell you anything. It's not going to be the chemical companies, probably. Okay, you can look at their advertising. You can look at their product brochures and all of that to get an idea of what they're doing. But they not, might not be happy to hear from you. The government, yeah, maybe when you have something to talk with them about. But the chemical scientists can't hide because they publish their research. And on every document they publish as a paper, as an article in a scholarly review, they put their addresses, phone numbers, and emails. It's like they're saying, call me. Oh, okay, great. I'm calling. I read your paper. You read my paper? My God, I think you're the first journalist who ever called me after reading one of my papers. Well, there's always a first time. Let's talk about this paper. Oh, I'll be happy to. You map the village and you say to yourself, who's gonna be glad to see me show up? And then you say to yourself, what documents are inside every house in the village? What paper are they keeping? What can I get from them? Et cetera. 
And once you've done that, you have eliminated one of the key anxieties that news reporters in particular absorb like mother's milk, which is I've got to find somebody to talk to before the end of the day. I've been there too. Okay. It's not a fun position to be in. And the other anxiety they have is, <clears throat> pardon me, what if so-and-so doesn't want to talk to me? What if the key person in this story doesn't want to talk to me? Well, what do you care? If they don't want to talk to you, go talk to the person in the house next door. And by the time you come back to them, you'll be able to say, listen, uh, you know, we really should talk because your name keeps coming up in conversations and your name appears on documents that are coming into my possession. And really, wouldn't you rather explain this? So, okay, you can think of other people to add to your village. There may be lawyers, there may be doctors, there may be all kinds of people. But until you start mapping them out, you're not gonna realize all the paths that you have to get at the center of your story and get what you need to have. Now, I've noticed increasingly that the people I work with like to set out their source map as an Excel file, you know, because they just find it more practical. I personally prefer to use Word file or another, you know, document creator, because, you know, I like to keep everything in the same format all the way through. But some people find this very natural. So what you do is you can make it like this. You have your timeline. Here's an event on the timeline. Okay, scientists discover dangerous chemicals. We're gonna interview the scientists. We're gonna get a public document. We'll have some confidential stuff, but the scientist thinks that they couldn't put in the article. We'll go to the laboratory so that we have a nice scene to put in the story, which will bring it to life, et cetera. You can make an Excel file that has as many columns as you like. You can also make a timeline as an Excel file, if you find that a congenial way to work. I don't see the advantage over doing it as a Word file, as long as your timeline includes the dates, the event that occurred, who was there, and whatever they said or did, and any documentation you have from that. You will cite an interview, you will cite an article, you will cite a speech, whatever. Okay, you keep the information and its source together at all times so that you don't have to cut back and forth looking for things. Okay, in uh, business school and economic parlance, this is called search time. And it's the principal reason that people say investigation is slow. Investigation would be a lot slower if we kept our information and its sources together at all times. That does not mean that you put a whole book in your timeline. It does mean that you put the extracts and the citation from the book. And by the way, if uh, any of you were working with lawyers who fact check your stuff to make sure that the, the following libel suit will not bankrupt your organization, they will love you for doing this. They will love you for being able to show the document that you cited within the 15 or 30 seconds after they ask for it. So, you know, this sounds like extra work. It's not extra work. It's making sure that you don't waste time and that you know what you're talking about. I'm gonna make one more point of this about this. Okay, actually a couple. The spatial representation of a paper trail takes you through every set of hands that must have touched the paper. Now, what this means is that you have multiple sources for every document you want. You are not confined to the author. You are not confined to the organization that ordered the document. A lot of people will have seen any document that is involved in an exchange. Okay, there may be confidential newsletters or emails or 
you know, uh, reports that are seen by only a few people. And by the way, when someone on this list gives you a document, the first thing you should say to them is how many other people have seen this? Because if it's only one other person, you are putting a noose around their neck if you even refer to it. Okay? Always make sure that any document you cite has been seen by multiple people. The more, the better. Okay? And ask your source if referring to that document will get them in trouble, because sometimes it will. And nothing justifies destroying someone's life just because they were stupid enough to talk to a careless journalist. Okay, I hope I've said that strongly enough. Okay. Now, the, the point I wanted to make was that there are basically two ways of structuring a story. One of them is chronologically, a sequence of events. I'll tell you a little more about that in a moment. The second is as a journey around different places. It's the difference between the Iliad and the Odyssey, which by the way, I think every journalist working in the Western tradition should read, okay? In one of them, we have a sequence of events that begins with the cause of the Trojan War and takes us up through how it unfolds. In the other, we have a hero trying to get home and moving from one place to another around the Aegean Sea. One of these two structures is going to be right for your story. If you're working in documentary film, it's probably a voyage. If, you are, uh, if you're working in print or you're writing a detailed history of something, it's certainly going to be a chronology. I'll tell you a little more about how to make that choice. But listen, you have to make that choice before you write the story, before you write the final draft of the story. Okay. Now, here's where we get into what we call the master file. A master file is one document that starts with your hypotheses, moves on through the timeline, into the timeline, you add quotes from documents or, inter or interviews. Okay, if you have several sources who talk about the same event, you can put quotes from those several sources under the events. As you're doing this, you're gonna be getting ideas, insights, summaries, write them into the file because when you sit down to write the final story, it's gonna be waiting for you like Christmas cake. Okay, you want to note where you can find your sources, how to contact them. Just one thing here, never, ever, ever put the, the name and contact information of a confidential source in your master file or any other document on your computer. Computers can be hacked or stolen. Don't do that, please, okay? And then, you know, under an event, if there's something more to verify, put it in and note when the last time was that you had contact with a given source. Because one of the things you're gonna do in an investigation that you don't do in uh, standard work is call them several times, maybe a dozen times, maybe 50 times in the course of an investigation. You know, you'll go back to them for one detail after another, like Columbo hounding his prime suspect. By the way, I watch Columbo <laughs> because uh, one of the best cops I ever met told me that Columbo was his model as a, as a human being and as an investigator. And he was a great investigator. So I thought maybe I should check this out too. If a great investigator tells you that they pay a lot of attention to someone, pay attention to that someone because, you know, that's how they learned and that's how you learn, okay? As we're going through the master file, and by the way, when I'm working on a story, I read through the whole master file every day. Sometimes it gets pretty long. In that case, I'll just look at the last stuff I put in. But you want to know, what haven't I done yet? Where are the contradictions in the story? There are always contradictions either because people tell you different versions or because they're making a mistake or because, you know, life is chaotic. 
unfortunately, it isn't as straightforward as uh, as uh, as whether a train runs on time. Okay, is there anything that seems to suggest that the hypothesis is wrong? If that's the case, change the hypothesis. Generally, the change will make the story stronger. Your hypothesis has to account for all of the information, or at least all of the information that makes sense. If there's something there that says, hey, wait a minute, wrong track, you have to go back. Maybe what looks like disproving the hypothesis is simply a question of degree. Not every priest in the Catholic Church is a pedophile. Okay, so if your hypothesis is all of the priests are, are pedophiles, you should be big enough to recognize that it's just not true, but some of them are. Okay, so take into account the information that doesn't make sense. And finally, look for connections across that information. You know, some of the most beautiful moments in an investigation come when you see the link across time or space between two different facts or two different statements and suddenly you know it illuminates the story you won't be able to do that unless you are going through what cops call the case file and what we call the master file frequently okay and this is one of my favorite models, Jim Steele, the guy who said, get a document state of mind and thereby changed our business, besides writing a lot of amazing stuff. And Jim says, write early and often. Well, when you write early and often, make it excerpts, make it little hits of insight or understanding and put it in that master file. You're going to use it very soon. Now, Here's how I suggest you write the story. And for those who have to leave in a couple of minutes, this will only take a couple of minutes. Save your master file under a new name so you don't lose your source material as you revise it. Now, what you do is read it through, look at what matters, and cut the rest. This will take several iterations. Fine. Then cut and paste it into the order you want to use. You'll be getting more ideas as you go. Put them in. So on the one hand, you're taking stuff out. On the other hand, you're putting stuff in. That's fine. In the end, you'll take out a lot more than you put in. Okay. Now is when you have to decide, is this story a chronology? Which for me works best with things like crime or policy failure. It could work with tax evasion. Okay, or is it an odyssey where we're, we're moving around different places? I once wrote a whole draft of a book that was based on a chronology and, the, and it stunk. It was unusable. It was about the, the French National Front and extreme right movement. And I realized that it was a heterogeneous movement that was doing many things in many places at the same time. So I had to restructure the whole book with the help of my late wife, Sophie Julianne. And, you know, we put it, we put together a new version in three weeks that worked. Think of the structure first, guys. Don't waste three weeks out of your life like I did, trying to make your data fit into the wrong structure, okay? If you're doing a chronology, keep a couple things in mind. It doesn't have to be a straight line. It doesn't have to run from the past to the present to the future. Typically, most investigations that use a chronological structure start in the present moment because that's where we grab people. This is happening to you now, folks. And then the next question they're going to have is, how did that happen? And you tell them. And then they want to know, how do we get out of this? And you tell them that. So the present structure becomes present, past, future. You can restructure your chronology when you edit the master file, that's the order of use. Okay, I know of one great ex example of an investigation that began in the future prior to climate change, which is changing a lot of things in our business. It was Raj Bariola's investigation into the uh, Union Carbide explosion in, uh, 
in India in 1984. Okay, he predicted that event. He predicted it many times. He wasn't able to stop it, but he was certainly able to cause a lot of trouble for the people who caused it. Typically, you use present, past, future. You can use any one of them. But, you know, just use one that works and not one that looks cute or makes you look like a literary genius. And speaking of literary geniuses, if you can't think of any other way to structure your material, look at the... Uh, at the narrative curve. In a tragedy, we start out with a great idea. It looks like it's going to happen, and then something falls off the tracks, and we come crashing down to earth. In a comedy, which, by the way, is not for laughs, it's something that ends well. We start in a place where we think the world is great, and then we start going down, just like Dante going into hell which is why, by the way, he called his great work uh, the Divine Comedy. And we go down into hell, and then we come back to a place where at least we can understand what happened and say, this is what we have to do so that it won't happen again. Keep those in mind, okay? And finally, if you're trying to write the story and it doesn't work, it's because nine times out of 10, it's because your structure is screwed up. If you are having a very hard time writing this story, stop what you're doing and go back to your structure and see if you have the material in the order of use so that you can do the transitions and make it fit together. Okay, well, I can't believe it. We got through all of that in something like 55, 50 minutes. <laughs> now, if anybody has to leave, I understand perfectly. Thank you for staying with us. If you want to stick around, I'll answer your questions. Uh, well, no, th thank you uh, very much, Mark. Dr. Hunter, please join me first in giving uh, Mark a big round of applause. Thank you. That was fantastic. I think everyone has their thank microphones you. off or else, or else I bored you silly. Well, that's okay. It won't well, be the first or the last time. So I just I just wanted to mention, uh, as we talked about, uh, Mark has very graciously agreed uh, to stick around for a little bit so we can make that transition. Before we do that, um, Esther has placed an evaluation, uh, which literally takes two minutes. So if you can uh, please fill out the evaluation, this is very helpful for us as we work to provide more uh, trainings for people. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is that we welcome you to join our community at CCIJ. And so I have put a link in in the chat. We, we do have uh, a paid membership. We also are very flexible. We understand people in very different financial circumstances. So we do have a sliding scale, but we do welcome you to uh, be part of our community. So uh, given that- see to very right, Pondra. We, we, we do have, um, it looks like we have at least uh, at least one hand up from uh, Jubilee. So Jubilee, would you, would you like to ask, ask your question to uh, Dr. Hunter? And then from there, uh, we'll see who, who wants to stick around. And again, you're, you're, you're welcome to stay. We'll stay for you know, kind of 25, 30 minutes. I will need to leave relatively soon, but um, uh, Esther, We'll then, you know, kind of take the questions forward from there. So Jubilee, the, the floor is yours and thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm Jubilee Malambo from Zambia. How do you I work for Home Television, one of the biggest private TV sessions in Zambia here. I've enjoyed the session. Uh, but one of uh, the, the question which I would love to find out is, are you capable of sharing the, the presentation uh, via WhatsApp? as well as after this kind of a session, which we have enjoyed so, so much, uh, uh, are you in the position to share or maybe to give us a, some certificate of, of attendance? For me personally, if I attend with a very big organization like this one uh, here in Zambia, it means a lot in my career as a journalist. The other question is um, under, under your organization, do you normally empower Journalists, if we have, we have a group which we want to, to, to do the TOTs in Zambia here, is it possible that you are able to fund those uh, uh, organizations? I thank you. Uh, hang on just a moment. I, I'm not sure I understand it. Let me answer your first question, okay? The uh, presentation has been shared in the chat, okay? 
and uh, if not, if not, just ask CCIJ for it. You know, I gave it to you, so you know you can you can have it. Yeah, and on on that on that specific point, thank you, um, Jubilee. We we will send out a follow up note, which will thank you for your attendance at the uh, participate at, at the event at the training. It will have the uh, presentation. It will also have um, a link to the evaluation. So that will be uh, that will be available to you um, uh, after after the presentation to confirm that you did in fact attend. Okay, now, Jubilee. What was the second part of your question? Because I'm not sure I understood it. You were asking, can you collaborate with other organizations? Yes, uh, my question was like here in Zambia, we don't usually receive such kind of a training. So we find this an opportunity to share a good message to this one. Now, do you normally collaborate with some media bodies like here in Zambia, we have Misa Zambia, Zima, it, it, to train journalists on these issues which are taking place right now, as well as are we expecting to have a certificate of attendance regarding this training? Because for me, this one means a lot. I thank you, Anta. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I don't give out certificates, but yet. But, uh, but yeah, I'll, you know, I work with people all over the place. So if somebody wants me to work with them, they just get in touch with us. You know, and you can, you can reach us through storybasedinquiry.com. Yeah, and, and, and we, we are also at CCIJ open to that uh, conversation about uh, collaborating and trying to support um, local journalists. So, so both you can reach out to Dr. Hunter and, and we can think about some possible avenues of, of collaboration. As I said earlier, Jubilee, the, the email will confirm that you, that you attended. We don't have certificates at the moment. We do have an email thanking you for, for attending. Okay. Okay, Ms. DeWitt. Devit, perhaps, wants to wants to ask a question. Please, you're, you're, please put your I'm mic on. Okay. I uh, now you can hear me, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, first of all, for the opportunity to uh, be a part of this. Um, I am a freelance journalist, but with no official background, uh, as in schooling. I trained myself. Lucky I you. Wrote, I wrote Most journalism schools do not train people in investigation. You're very lucky. <laughs> That's good because I yeah. tried it myself and I wrote a small book on the effect the mafia has on a certain region in Italy. I'm Dutch. I'm not living in Italy, but I was very familiar with the area. What a great book. I, I like it. <laughs> Um, what was bothering me during the whole writing process was the fact that as a foreigner writing about another country, I needed to investigate through the internet, through my acquaintances, and uh, well, the mafia isn't exactly a topic people locally want to talk about, although I did visit the region to try to have conversation, and I did actually get some interesting interviews done. But the question I have is, what do you need to do to prevent something becoming slander? Is it enough to use other news articles or documents? No. What else do you need to... I mean, address? maybe, maybe, okay, but, you know, you know, extensive news coverage has been a factor in a number of stories I've done. I worked on contaminated blood and I, I did a high profile criminal case in France. There were journalists all over it. And a lot of them were just nonsense. They didn't know what they were talking about. Okay, so if you're going to use those articles, you have to try and verify them. The other thing is try to get, you know, try to get the sources that they refer to. And by the way, Wikipedia is great for that. Articles in Wikipedia direct you to primary sources. Okay. So the the basic thing for investigative journalists is verify, verify, verify. No, the basic thing for investigative journalists is primary sources. A primary source is someone or something with direct knowledge of the event. Okay. Is, uh, a journalist is a, a journalist is an observer. It's not an he's not an actor. He or she is not an actor. Prime source, a witness. Pardon me. Uh, when you have a witness of an event, is that witness the prime source? The yes, 
it's one prime source you want more than one witness you know or you know or you need to look at the effects of an event if there were only two people in the room and one of them talked to you they're at risk yeah okay but you know you want to get as close to the primary material as you can peer-reviewed scientific research is a primary resource the data on which the uh study is based is a primary source okay personal observation is a primary source okay but you need to be very clear about that okay an investigation based on secondary sources is analysis or opinion it is not investigation investigation is about getting the direct proof yeah thank you so much that my was pleasure very... yeah okay thank you very much uh mr witt and i appreciate people sharing uh, questions or, or contact information or, or comments uh, in the chat. Uh, anybody else? And, and at this point, after uh, we field the next question, I will need uh, to sign off. But Esther, as I mentioned, will uh, continue the conversation. And thank you so much, Mark, for a tremendous presentation and your generosity and being beyond the, the allocated time. Really, thank you very much. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, other, other questions or comments uh, that people wanted to ask? Uh, uh, Dr. Hunt, it looks like Deepa. Yeah, Deepak, Deepak had a, a question earlier. So why don't we hear from uh, Deepak? It looks like Kata has one as well. So Deepak, over to you. Hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I have been a, a great fan of your book, Story Beast Inquiry. And it's good that, you know, we finally have you in person, you know, talking about your wonderful work and the process. So my question is, I've uh, I had investigated a tax evasion of a big multinational company. Yeah. Uh, with in, in tax havens and you know, across the world in many, many countries. But I struggled to find the victims, you know, because it's a big company. And, you know, like, because as you said, you know, you need to put a human face in a story, you know. So that in that case, as well as in a, in a corruption story and big, you know, Although you mentioned that, you know, it has a direct impact because uh, if there is a corruption, you know, uh, the government <laughs> would have enough revenge and people would suffer. But in order to put a human face, a direct, you know, uh, victim, so how do you uh, go about that? Well, why don't you, you know, why don't you look at uh, some of the people who are dependent on tax revenues? For example, uh, why don't you look at the budget of national education? Let's say that the uh, that the company evaded five hundred million dollars. I don't know how many krona that that makes in uh, Indian rupees, but you know how many schools can you build for that? How many toilets can you put in schools? A lot of schools don't have toilets. You know how many teachers could you hire? You know, look at what the tax money could have been used for. And then, uh, then ask the people, what could you do with five hundred million dollars? <laughs> okay, thank you for that question, and thank you, Mark, for your response. Kata has her hand raised. Kata. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello. No? <laughs> hello, Kata. Hi. So I have like a generic question regarding um, the sources. Uh, identity and safety. Uh, I'm more a science and environmental journalist, just stepping into investigative journalism. On many occasions, personally, I always fear for my sources. And like, I'm very happy if they're like willing to go on record, but sometimes I feel like maybe they're not totally aware of the consequences that it can happen. And what do you think, what is the right technique to balance of having sources on the record, but also feeling ethically responsible for them and maybe briefing them about the possibilities? Well, one thing is you don't want to quote them on anything that's defamatory, okay, first of all, because, you know, they're responsible and you're responsible, okay? Um, a second thing is that, uh, oh, and by the way, this, this applies to Ms. DeVitt as well. You know, one of the things you should be doing is reading libel judgments handed down by the courts in any jurisdiction you're working in. You know, I, I have a very good working knowledge of American and uh, French libel law because, you know, 
because I have to. Okay, I don't want to find myself in a courtroom except as a witness. Okay, now the uh, the other thing is, you know, I'm very aware that a lot of environmental activists have been killed in recent years. Okay, and I'm sure you're very aware of it too. So what you can do in such a situation is use what they tell you and see if there is any paper. For example, an environmental impact statement, a legal action, whatever, that uh, verifies what they say. You know, the absolute master at this technique is Seymour Hirsch. You know, a lot of Seymour Hirsch's um, sources are former CIA people, okay? He, you know, he gets the CIA, uh, the, there's an association for former CIA guys and women. And he, you know, reads that to see who's just retired. And then he takes them to lunch, you know? So, <laughs> oh, well, it's brilliant. It's simple and brilliant, <laughs> like most things that are brilliant. And, uh, you know, from them, he will hear what's happening. And then he will look for the documentation. I mean, this is an inversion of the way that people like me work, okay? Because I will look for the paper first, yeah, me you too. know, to see, to see if I can understand the mechanisms, to see if I can map out an ideal process that people in power are supposed to be following. And then I will see where they diverge from that process. Okay, he does it differently. And I strongly suggest that you read uh, his story on Abu Ghraib, which is you know, a, a great, great story in the history of the profession. And it's an open access on the New Yorker site. Look at how he does it, okay? Because he, he does refer to documents there, but he goes looking for the documents after he knows what he's looking for, mm -hmm. okay? Maybe his sources tip him off to it. Or maybe he just uses his, his fertile mind. He does have an extremely fertile mind. But you, know, you can document what you are told in interviews after the fact, and then you don't have to cite the source. Uh, OK. OK? Because many times there are like peasants working in the land, and they see a lot of things by their eyes, but they might not be aware of the consequences that they can brought on themselves by you know witnessing and telling me about uh, those things yeah yeah i know i know but you know there may be objective objective things that you can witness or get a record of okay that will point you you know point you in the right direction and you know i've already said you can't really rely on newspaper accounts, but when I did the story of pollution in France, okay, you know, the, I found an interview with one of the owners of these polluting farms where he said 70% of our margin comes from intensive hog raising. Okay, well, that's him. If he didn't file a libel charge against the newspaper that quoted him, mm. then, then I can use that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's different stuff, but the basic thing is this, okay, once you know what happened, there should be some way to document it. The fundamental problem is figuring out what happened. The hypothesis is the first step, okay? And then you're yeah. verifying that to see if in fact that does correspond to the available information. But, you know, if someone gives you a, gives you a tip, you know, follow it up. You know, if they say, well, they're taking our land, they're doing this. Well, there are land records. If land is uh, being- Not necessary. I'm based in Ecuador and here people- Yeah, I know that. Okay, yeah. I understand <laughs> in a number of places there isn't. But you can, you know, you can, uh, you can perhaps see if anything's being built on the land. Yeah. Okay, that's a giveaway. You don't build a, you don't build a house on somebody else's land or a warehouse or a barn or whatever. You know, if you're if you're if your machinery is going on to the land, it's probably because you're using it, et cetera. Yeah. You know, there, there are different things you can spot. And then eventually you have to go to the targets and say, look, what does this mean? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. OK, I, I hope that helps. Yeah, totally. Thank you.
Okay. Mark, we have a question in the chat. Um, I'll read it out loud it's from Lisa Rudman. In your example of keeping it simple and agricultural polluters getting subsidized, et cetera, where did you get the two lists? Especially where did you get the list? <laughs> they were of published the by the, the, the EU uh, keeps a pollution database. I didn't even know it existed. You know, I mean, this allows me to make another point. Okay. I'm not a data guy. I'm, I'm from, uh, I'm from the generation that was slow to figure out how to do data analysis, but it's not a problem because there's so many people out there who are great at it. You know, so if, if you belong to this organization or to the global investigative journalism network, you know, you see who these people are and you, you contact them. So in this case, Stefan Vermeer knew that there was an EU database of polluters. We all knew that there was a database of uh, agricultural subsidies. So Stephen knew how to cross those lists. Okay, it's, it's uh, God, what is the name for it? A geographical mean? I can't recall at the moment, but he had a data technique that enabled him to cross the two uh, databases and come up with a ranking of the people who are at the same time getting subsidies and polluting. Okay, so in, in that case, we knew where we were starting. But, you know, the larger answer there is that there's a huge amount of information available in the public domain. And understanding where those sources are, you know, compiling a personal library of those sources is part of the job. You know, some of those sources you can go back to for 10, 15, 20 years, you know, the, the agricultural subsidies database has been mined by hundreds of reporters over the years to, uh, to do a number of great stories. You know, I mean, honestly, uh, when we started out, I said to myself, is there, is there any other way we can use this stuff? And, you know, yes, there are other ways to use it. But first, you have to know it exists. And you won't know it exists if you're not looking for it. You know, oh, my God, I remember I was doing an investigation of, uh, of uh, an art dealer in France who, you know, we, we suspected of getting a disproportionate amount of the, the Ministry of Culture's subsidies. And in fact, there was a database that detailed those subsidies that said who got what. And, uh, you know, I discovered it by accident. I was interviewing a, a functionary at the Ministry of Culture and she was typing on her computer over the phone. And I said, what are you typing? And she said, I'm going into the database. And I said, oh, what database? You know, so, you know, you find these things as you go along or you can create your own databases if you have a su sufficient number of documents. You know, besides, I mean, all of the documents you should you find should be databased in one way or another. You know, you should have a list of these things and what their contents are. But, you know, then you mine them and you see if there's any way you can combine them. Mark, we have time for one more question. This was in a post earlier in the session from Gia. Uh, I'll read that question out loud. One of the investigative news stories is to answer social issues. If someone feels wronged, but they did make a mistake, should the journalist stop the investigation? You mean if the person who, who made the initial complaint was wrong? Uh, if Gia is still here, if you can provide some clarity to that question. Otherwise, Mark, I will invite you. Oh. Okay. okay, I'm here. <laughs> How do you do? Yeah, so uh, I'm a journalist from Radio Republic Indonesia, and I just uh, came up with one issue. Uh, suddenly, uh, one of them feel like I disturb uh, their what is it like their case, so they don't want uh, me to continue what I already did before. So yeah. must I stop, or maybe I just continue because I think. It's very sensitive because I just work on government. So what must I do? Okay, thank you. Okay, well, is the story important? Okay, first, let me ask another question. Do you think the story is true? 
Yes, uh, the story is true. I mean, like, uh, I have, like, uh, corruption issues and then about um, illegal logging, etc. So oh, I think yeah. it's very important to up that those kind of case on the media. But uh, the problem is I work for government, so I think I must stop. But the society needs those kind of news. So what must so I the, do? So, the, so you're working for a government agency or media? Yes, yes and- I am. And their friends are the people who are doing the wrong. Is that it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, there are a couple things you can do with that. One is you can gather the information and uh, keep it in a secure place. And if you ever leave that job and go someplace else, you can use it. Okay. You can gather the information, keep a file and uh, keep a master file on it, chronology, documents, etc. And if you ever change jobs, you can use it. Another thing you can do is hand it over to someone else. If you feel that the situation is urgent and you're not in a position to do the story, you can pass the material to someone else, okay? Who is in a position to do something with it. Okay, okay. But, you know, but okay. if, if, if you can't do the story without losing your job, then, you know, my advice would be not to do the story until you change jobs. Okay. I think I get it, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you know, I, you know, I hope that doesn't sound too cynical, but, you know, if, if you lose your job and you don't have another one and you need the job to live, you won't do any more stories. So, you know, you need to think, you know, ultimately, if you're working in a place that keeps you from doing the work that you think is important, you have to find another place to do your work. And one of the things you might consider is going to work for an NGO. Okay? I mean... The, the current estimate is, is that about 60% of all, what, all of what we call investigative journalism is being done by NGOs. You know, so, you know, if, if this is a story, if, if you know, the, the effect of corruption on the environment is something that you think is of vital importance and you can't do it in your job, and there's an NGO doing this, why not look around and see if they would like to have someone who really cares about the subject and knows how to investigate to work with them? Okay, thank you for that, Mark. And to that point, CCIJ being one of those NGOs, we do collaborate a lot with other journalists to do those very kinds of stories. And we ourselves um, have the opportunity to fund uh, stories that folks pitch. Uh, so uh, that's just one of the many opportunities uh, that CCIJ offers to the investigative journalism community. Mark, I just want to thank you so much for not only presenting for 60 minutes, but willing to stay another 30 minutes. It was uh, clear in the chat box what a tremendous presentation it was. People walked away with some really good information. Um, so thank you. Once again, everybody, if you could please uh, share your appreciation and chat or however else, as I mentioned in the chat, we will be following up with you all with an email, um, including his slide deck, um, the evaluation, as well as some more information about CCIJ. So on behalf of CCIJ, uh, I just wanna thank everybody. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are at. Mark, would you like to say the last words? Yes, I would. If anybody here is teaching, UNESCO just published a 10 model, 10 module teaching package about, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the major update of story based inquiry of the manual since 2009. It's set out with PowerPoints, teaching notes, and everything else. If you're training other people to do this or you're thinking about training other people, you can pick it up on the storybasedinquiry.com website or from UNESCO. It's called I'm going to type it into the chat 
and then I will release you. <laughs> and it's called investigating sustainable development because if you look at the sustainable development goals, they're a template for uh, just about any subject that you want to investigate. Voila. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. And we uh, thanks, Esther. Yeah, no problem. Happy to share the wealth. So everybody have a wonderful morning, afternoon and evening.